It's just, oh, then it's gone. This is the Alpine I-509 WAJL. In today's video, we're gonna find out if this $2,400 head unit is all that it's hyped up to be. Real quick reminder, if you are enjoying this content, please remember to hit that like button. And if you want to see more videos like this, such as our upcoming I-509 WAJL preamp voltage test or full installation video, be sure to click subscribe and turn on all notifications. Let's dive into all the features of this head unit. One thing I do want to point out, Alpine does this kind of like amber illumination, which matches the amber that's in the gauges here. But these button colors cannot be changed, just like the X49 WRJL, they're always gonna light up amber. But they did do a nice job with the matching on that. I definitely feel like this is an upgrade in vibrancy on the screen compared to the X49 WRJL that we had. However, I don't think this screen is as nice as what comes with the ILXF 509 or 511. This is more along the same quality of screen that's included with the ILX 507. It's still considered a high resolution screen, but I have found just like the ILX 507, there are certain parts of the screen that are more responsive than others. I don't know why that is, but I'll show you right here. If I go into the super advanced EQ, and if I wanna tap one of these, oh, this one's behaving. Ah, see, right there. You should be able to tap each one. The middle of the screen on this one seems to be a little better than the ILX. 507, but you may end up just using that band button when you're doing these EQ settings. And if I were to go to that fader balance control, just like on the 507, this is super responsive, but other parts of the screen, not as much. Speaking of the EQ control, this thing has a ton of features. You have a 13 band parametric EQ, which is what I was just in, and you can adjust this just you know for front and rear under basic eq or you can go back into advanced eq here and actually have each separate channel alpine is pitching this as basically having a dsp built in digital sound processor built into the head unit and you do have a huge amount of control with this you have not only all the different bands here 80 125 200 315 5 k 2k 3.15k you can adjust the the width on here and you can go up and down so there is a lot of control and flexibility as far as what you want to adjust you can adjust your q factor on here so you can do it narrow medium and you can have multiple presets but you do only get three presets the other thing i'll bring up just in this particular application this client did have the pack ap4 ch41 r2 along with the stock 8.4 inch u connect head unit and a jl audio tweak 88 we left the tweak 88 in line and are just using this for basic audio control he was having a lot of issues with his u connect radio which is why we upgraded this one aside from this 13 band parametric q you do have a ton of crossover control for front rear and subwoofer and tons of different frequencies that you can choose from as far as what you actually want to adjust from I believe as low as 20 hertz all the way up to 250. We go over to the low pass filter we can adjust from 4k all the way up to 20. Also have up to 24 dB on the slope and if you find that beep as annoying as I do there is actually a way to turn that off. I'll show you in a second. And I just wanna show you that you do have full time correction menu and you can do this either in milliseconds, centimeters, or inches. Regarding the subwoofer level control, we did some testing with the RTA and we found just like the ILX 507 that the subwoofer, if you put this all the way up to 15, you do not wanna put the volume on your radio past 30 because that is when you'll start to see that subchannel clipping. However, if you leave it at three, you can go all the way up to peak volume on the head unit without seeing any clipping on that subchannel. We're just going to advise the client of this and leave it right at 12, which sounds pretty good in this particular vehicle. The other thing that I do like about Alpine, if all of this EQ control kind of scares you, there is just some easy EQ controls. Just tap that subwoofer button and you have your simple tone adjustments for bass and treble. Tap it again and you have your subwoofer control. Regarding that annoying beep, if we just go into the setup here, go to your system, key sound feedback. I'm going to turn that off for the rest of this video. This screen lighting lets you adjust basically the brightness of these buttons, but again, not the color. Enhanced text, 
option is basically going to make these icons a lot bigger, which reminds me kind of a Kenwood layout. One important thing to note, most of these units are shipping with the original software. There is an update that needs to be done. Now, when you do that update, you do have to go into this menu. Once the update is complete, you have to scroll down to clear all settings and reset. When you hit that reset, that's going to wipe away all of the audio settings that you've made, even if you've preset them. So be sure to take pictures once you get all that dialed in to exactly how you want it, because in the future, when you do an update and you hit that reset, it's going to wipe all of those settings away. This unit is obviously SiriusXM capable, also has HD radio. You do have two USB inputs, which is something I'm a fan of. You've got your primary USB for Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. That's going to give you 2.4 amp charging. Secondary USB is 1.5 amp. That secondary USB is also for future expansion. This unit does not have GPS navigation. When I hit that nav button, it's going to bring me to the maps on my iPhone or Google Maps on Android. However, there is going to be a future release of a satellite-based GPS navigation that would plug into USB 2. If you're going to want to add that, you could route that secondary USB over to a glove box so that you don't have something plugged into your USB media hub. Keep that in mind for future expansion. And this does support both Apple CarPlay and Android Auto wirelessly. If you do want to utilize the wireless feature of Apple CarPlay, there is a trick to using the HDMI input. I actually did not set my phone up wirelessly, so I'm going to do that right now. Go to device list, add device. I'm going to go into the Bluetooth settings on my phone. There's the Alpine DA. I'm going to tap that. There's the iPhone on the screen. Tap that. And I'm going to pair. Allow. I know it says failed on the screen, but I think it's going to work. Maybe not. All right, so I'm now connected wirelessly to Apple CarPlay. If I wanted to use that HDMI input, there's two things that you're going to need. Just a standard HDMI mail to mail and your Apple Lightning Digital AV adapter. So this cable is going to connect to my iPhone. I'm going to go over to HDMI input. I'm going to try to open up something on YouTube. So I'm trying to play something here. It's playing on my phone. See how it paused as soon as I actually tried to get in here? What I actually have to do is go into the device menu and disconnect Apple CarPlay. Now that I've disconnected from Apple CarPlay, I can go to HDMI and I can see what was playing on my phone. If I want to go back to Apple CarPlay, I can disconnect my HDMI, go back into device menu, hit disconnect, connect, CarPlay, okay. And now I have my wireless CarPlay back. Not too bad, just a little workaround. One thing that is really nice is you retain your factory volume control, also tuner knob. Climate controls, all of that is retained. Nice integration, I think. I don't know what you guys think, but I think Alpine did a nice job with the graphics. Although this unit is rated at four volts on the preamp, we were seeing, like I was seeing with the ILX 507, about three volts on the front and rear, but we were definitely getting four volts on the sub. And I should mention this unit is high resolution capable. It can play back up to 24 bit, 96 kilohertz FLAC files. You can stream high resolution content from Tidal, Amazon Music, Apple, and have you know, better than CD quality. So from a sound quality perspective, this is a huge improvement over the X49 WRAJL that we had. They definitely have a lot more detail. It's a lot smoother than the previous version. And there's also a lot more control to smooth it out even more. So the actual playback, the sound quality is a vast improvement over that previous X49 WRAJL. You do lose some factory features. If you're using the Uconnect Guardian services, you will lose that app that you have through your phone for Remote Start. If you have the Remote Start on your fob, that will still work. So don't worry about losing that. It's just the Uconnect and the SiriusXM Guardian services that you'll lose, which is interesting because it does show OEM SiriusXM in here, but we did have to put in a separate SXB300 tuner for that. Buried in the Maestro menu, you have access to vehicle settings. You do retain all of those settings that are in the factory screen. One thing I'm not sure is if this is going to retain turn-by-turn -turn GPS directions in the cluster for CarPlay. I know with our X49 WRJL, we did have the factory navigation unit in that car, and we did 
have turn by turn directions in the cluster. So I'm gonna see if I can take this on the road real quick and see if that is retained. Turn right, then turn left. Turn left onto Gray's Bridge Road, then turn left onto Old Gray's Bridge Road. So I thought if I went into those IDATA Link Maestro settings and I changed what was on this option, audio info display, that it would change what's being displayed there. And it does, if I hit source, it still says Apple CarPlay, it just changes how it says it. So I don't think you're gonna get turn by turn directions, unfortunately. I'll try it with this one though, see what happens. Let's try this again. Starting okay. route to home. Starting route to home. Proceed to Gray's Bridge Road, then turn left. Still not getting any turn by turn directions. A couple of glitches that I've noticed. I was just trying to get into this setup menu to go, go into the camera settings and I can't get into there. And this is, it happened to me once before. Eventually it lets me get in there. I don't know if the Maestro module is doing something or is communicating and it's busy and that's why it won't let me do it. But I did just get off the phone with Alpine to confirm that I'm not missing anything. It does not retain the park guidance lines. So that is normal. There is the optional on-screen lines that you can add from the Alpine radio, but the factory guidance lines are not retained. Let me see if it'll let me back into this menu. No. Turn the car off. Get my little fingerprints off of here. Yeah, I don't know, I can't go in there right now. The other thing I've noticed is the climate controls don't always display on the screen, even though I'm adjusting it. But if I were to go into the vehicle information screen, then it will pop up. But normally if I adjust the fans, that should just pop up automatically. It seems like the maestro is busy or it's doing something. And when that happens, I can't get into this menu and the climate doesn't automatically pop up. So I might have figured it out. I don't know if it's timing issue or just coincidence, but once I basically switched the source back to radio, the last source I had used was Apple CarPlay, even though I didn't have the cable connected. But once I disconnected and went to FM, I was able to go back into setup, go to factory audio, and then I was able to get into the Maestro settings and features again. Yeah, see, I don't, I don't know why you have the option here, but it doesn't do it. And Alpine says it's not supported. So I don't know what that's about. Let me see if the fans come up again. Yeah. All right, let me try to connect CarPlay again and see what happens. All right, so Apple CarPlay is connected. Let me see if it can go back into that OEM menu. Yeah, so I, I don't know. That was just a thought that it had something to do with CarPlay being connected. It didn't. I don't know why sometimes it can get into there and sometimes I can't. I don't know, what do you guys think? Is it worth the $2,400 price? I think for a lot of people, it checks off a lot of boxes. It makes a lot of sense, but for others, it might be a bit of a stretch. What do you guys think? Let me know in the comments below.